Hey guys, Scott Rolliter here. Doing a video today on one of my favorite drills. It's called the Perfect Position Drill. I've uh, covered it before, and I have a separate video kind of showing how to do the drill uh, on my webpage and on my YouTube channel. So I'll, I'll put a link on the YouTube channel and uh, put a description for this on my webpage as well, so you can look at that original video. But uh, I'll kind of talk as we start going through this. So this, uh, in this particular version of the drill, I'm using six balls. The goal is to start with ball in hand and try to run the balls out in order. Uh, and I put in quotes perfectly. So in other words, you want to try to stay in line on every shot. It's a little different than playing a ghost. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, strict than playing the ghost. You're not allowed to have any difficult shots you have to determine for yourself what a difficult shot is but uh, you have to be honest with yourself so no difficult shots no bank shots uh, no accidentally crossing over the line and, and hitting the ball into a pocket other than what you're intending to play shape for so in other words just staying in line playing what I would call perfect position now again there's going to be some guidelines there's always going to be times where you're trying to get an angle on a ball but you end up a little straight or you almost scratch, or you're, you know, maybe you're right at the limit. You're at like a 40 degree cut or a 45 degree cut, but but you feel it's a makeable shot, you know, like an 80% or better makeable shot. That's kind of the, the goal we're going for, kind of that four out of five uh, percentage. So the whole point of the drill is you start usually with three balls. I show this in the uh, in the other video I'm gonna that I referenced, and you work on it until you're at about a 75 or 80 percent success rate so if you do this 10 times you want to be able to do it like 8 out of 10. if you're doing it 20 times which is what i would prefer uh you want to be able to do it about you know again 15 or 16 out of 20. and if you can accomplish that then you add another ball into the mix so you start with three you work on four five six etc uh, as i mentioned in my other video Doing this with seven balls is very difficult. Again, it's different than playing the ghost. You're you're not able to shoot any difficult shots or shoot bank shots. Um, you know, do some of these crazy kind of recovery shots that uh, yeah we're all used to doing to try to extend our runs. Apologize for any accidental uh, construction noise in the background there. Um, you see the table way in the back. It's also a gold crown six. It's about to be replaced with a, a Resson table. And we are building stadium seating in the back for uh, my monthly free clinics that I do. And we're going to mount some permanent camera positions. It'll make it a little bit easier to, uh, to do the clinics and to record them. Uh, you can see the table right here I'm shooting on is also a pro edition, pro cut pocket, uh, nine foot. Uh, gold crown six and we've got a projection system over the top that you've probably seen in some of my previous videos where I can project images onto the table which helps with uh, teaching and also obviously helps with practice there's a lot of good drills and everything on that and uh, but you can see around this table if I get sometimes I get 30 or 35 40 people showing up it, it's difficult uh, for people to sit around comfortably and, and watch so uh, having this seated in the back and, and doing a, a better microphone setup and better camera setup will be uh, be fantastic for teaching the clinics and also for teaching and recording some of the private lessons that I do. Okay, so right now that was, um, uh, while I was talking there, if you watched, that was another completion of the drill. So, and you see, I just kind of throwing the balls out, throw them together, throw them around, whatever. Um, you know, if they get frozen up next to each other, you know, spread them apart a little bit. Uh, again, this is not ghost a ghost drill. We're not trying to have to break out clusters and things like that. This is basically simulating whether it's three balls, four, five, six, seven, whatever. You're simulating, let's say you got ball in hand or someone left you a really good, perfect opening shot. Can you get out? Can you stay in line perfectly? It really helps you work on patterns or whatever. And as I mentioned in the other video, uh, you won't see me do it here. But when you're learning, the key is if you miss the shot or if you miss position, you want to set it back up again. That's where the learning part of the drill comes in. Figure out why you missed. Figure out what you did wrong to get position and keep shooting it until you're comfortable that you got it. That sort of rewires your brain uh, and adds this extra information, so to speak, into your mental computer 
so that the next time you see that shot in a game, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I remembered I messed that shot up when I did it this way. This is the proper way to hit it. That's exactly why all the great commentators out there, you know, Grady Matthews and Bill and Cardona back in the day, uh, Alex Laley was one of my favorites, Jeremy Jones, who definitively is one of my favorites right now. I, I'm a AAA player, and I learn something almost every time I watch a video that's commentated by by Jeremy or Alex. Uh, Jeremy sees things before they even happen. He sees the pitfalls. He, you know, Alex is a, very similar. They mention what what the player's going to do. Like on a shot like that, they'll know the person's going to go two rails versus one rail versus whatever. Um, it's all based on percentages, a and uh, obviously there's some personalization that you can do. And there's different ways people like to go, you know, forward with inside, backwards with outside. But there's kind of a perfect or, or preferred way of playing position on certain patterns. And uh, the pros figure that out because they're very good players. They've got a lot of talent. They put up thousands and thousands of hours into the game. And they've learned what works and what doesn't work for them and for everyone in general. Okay, so I'm going to talk now, now that I've kind of set some things up, I'm, rather than just keep talking, I'm going to try to talk over some of the position things. Again, you're seeing that I'm uh, just trying to stay in line, simple patterns. I'm not hitting the ball overly hard. Uh, if I can, the way I just hit that ball, where I just kind of roll the ball, that's going to be my preferred method for playing position. I, I don't want to have to hit a bunch of heavy draw shots. I don't want to have to... Um, use a ton of spin. There's always opportunities for that, and there's times for that where that's going to happen, but try not to do that. So now this ball, I remember, I almost screwed up. If I had rolled another, let's say, an inch or two inches forward, I would not have counted that, because even though I might have been able to cut the ball, I would have been a little bit too on top of it. It would have been a very close shot with like a 50 or 60 degree angle. It would have been too much, but I stopped like almost literally just in the nick of time to where um, I considered that to be an acceptable leave. Okay, so this should be uh, four zero now. I really like this drill, um, you know, for a player at my level, you know, playing the ghost and getting that practice of breaking the balls properly and, and spreading them nicely and learning to break with patterns and all of that, that that's very good practice. But um, I really pride myself on my ability to get out at the end of the rack. Obviously, I make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. But this can give you a lot of confidence. So even if you're starting this with three, when you're starting this with three balls, it's really to learn the foundation of position play. But when you start to get into four and five balls, you're teaching yourself, you're giving yourself confidence that, hey, if I get ball in hand on the five ball, and I do this five ball drill 14 out of 20 times, 70%, let's say, maybe not quite good enough to get to add another ball, but pretty pretty proficient. When you get ball in hand on the five, you should have all the confidence in the world that two out of three times you're going to get out from, from a general position of the balls interrupt myself here i almost made a mistake there and again if i wanted to be super super strict i could say that doesn't count because i didn't intend to come down that path toward the pocket but i did have to navigate that space between the four and the three and so it was a little touchy and sometimes you are going to get a little close to things so you can't be you know as much as i try to be sometimes with my personality it's tough to actually be perfect and uh, i get very hard on myself I, if I was in a match, I probably would have shaken my head a little bit at that. But again, you got to take the good with the bad. You're going to get some good rolls or bounces or, or, or stop an inch or two before, you know, a pocket. And sometimes you're going to be on the other end of that. It just sort of happens. By the way, from a, um, even though I use the word roll there, I generally don't like to refer to things as that. Uh, had that ball scratched, I've seen players say, oh man, I got a bad roll. No, you didn't get a bad roll. You hit the ball poorly. If you hit the ball properly, it would not have scratched either based on speed or lying to the pocket. So, uh, you know, if you 
If you hit a shot and you go three rails around the table and you glance off another ball and you scratch, it's not a bad roll. You hit the ball to make it go there. So suck it up and realize that that's the way it is. I will occasionally refer to something as a bad roll if somebody, let's say, makes a fantastic shot. Like, you know, they jump the ball and they're drawing the ball back two rails and it, it happens to hook behind another ball. Again, you hit the ball with that speed, that angle, to, to get that result. But when you make a phenomenal shot like that, I remember in the World uh, World Pool Championships recently, I think one of the one of the Asian players, he made a fantastic shot going three rails around the table and got like barely hooked on the ball. So, you know, you can you can call that a bad roll, but I would just say, well, it's a little unlucky, right? Because he hit such a great shot and wasn't rewarded for it. But sometimes you hit a crappy shot and you get rewarded, and sometimes you hit a great shot and you don't get rewarded. I mean, that's just kind of the way it goes. But in in either case, you know, you're the one that hit the ball. Um, to me, like a bad roll, for instance, would I would call that where like sometimes I've seen people. There was a famous case not that long ago, a year or two ago where uh, let's say you hit the ball into the pocket and the, the ball swirls around the pocket and, and pops back up on the table. Uh, I forget the guy, I think it was a Polish player that did that. He hit the ball into the side pocket and the ball literally popped back up and just sat right in front of the side again. And that That's a bad, you know, that's a bad roll. <laughs> I guess in general, what I'm trying to say is don't blame, don't blame physics for, uh, uh, you know, where the ball goes. It's It's going where it went because you hit it there. Take take some. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> take some responsibility for your actions. I'm going to come back through here and add video overlays to kind of keep score. Um, but I believe that's like maybe five zero or six zero. Uh, just for your guys' information, I, I usually I usually when I do six ball version of this drill, I'm usually around thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Uh, you know, I make little mistakes here and there and lose concentration. Sometimes people come up to me. I mean, the six ball version of the drill is definitely more difficult than five. Um, if I do it this three, if I do this with three balls, I almost always get out. You know, nineteen out of twenty, twenty out of twenty. Um, Four balls, I'm usually around 17, 18 out of 20. Uh, with five balls, I'm probably closer to 16, 17. Uh, again, I'll make a few more mistakes because of the added balls. And again, if you do this with five balls 20 times, that's 100 shots. So that means out of 100 shots, which I just did this drill the other day with five balls, and I did it 19 out of 20, which is probably my personal best. And I was really hitting the ball clean that day. And that's one mistake out of 100 shots, position and making the ball. That's pretty good for someone at my level. The pros, if they're playing a race to, you know, 9 or 10 or 11 and 9 ball, you know, you're roughly shooting about 100 balls. And they usually, if they're shooting 850 or 900 AccuStats rating, um, that is, uh, again, right there. Had I come just another inch or two more, I would not have counted it. Even though I can make that ball, I would have... Oh, actually, I must have decided not to count it already. Um I don't remember that. Maybe I maybe I had intended to come all the way across the ball and play shape in the other corner. Uh, I can't remember. But So again, you see, I was honest there with myself. I could have very easily made that ball, uh, but I was being honest with myself and did not count that. And that screw gun noise in the background is a little crazy. Sorry about that, guys. But uh, I don't have a whole lot of opportunity sometimes to record these videos. Um, I'm probably going to have a little bit of a better space to record some of this that's private and don't have to worry about background music and people bothering me and all that pretty soon. But um, right now, this is uh, I take advantage of the time that I have. Um, and then this afternoon, I had the camera with me and uh, the tripod and just decided to do some filming for myself and then do this video. So you can see again, most of the shots that I'm shooting, um, I'm, I'm paying attention. You can see there's certain spots where I'm walking around the table to see where my line should be. Uh, there's times where you kind of just automatically know and that's fine. But if there's any time that you don't know, you should definitely walk around and look at it from a different perspective. It feeds information into your eyes and it really helps your brain execute the shot that you're looking at. Otherwise, it's really about a matter of just simply 
playing position as as efficiently as possible, shooting the ball nice and smooth, not trying to overhit it. There are obviously times based on the patterns of the balls where you're going to have to move the cue ball two or three rails, or you get a little straight and you have to kind of hit the ball a little hard to force an angle, create an angle, or possibly maybe you know draw the ball down table and as opposed to having a nice angle. But again, that's what this drill is for to teach you those proper patterns. Now, sometimes I will come down and look at that line on, on where I'm standing right now before I would have shot that ball to make sure I come into the, the ball the right way. But given the position of the five ball, I didn't feel it was necessary because the five is very accessible. And pretty much whatever angle I get on the five, I can either come one rail out, two rails out, or one rail forward or two rails forward and get a decent shot on the six and the seven. So part of experience is looking at the table layouts and determining when you need to be a little more precise and when you need to look at that, that line. That was a little far away there because I did get a little funny on the ball because I didn't look at it. But again, certainly manageable and nothing that I would consider to be, um, um, you know, something that I wouldn't count. That's actually a bad habit right now. Part of it's because... Uh, I try to go a little too fast sometimes when I'm practicing, but uh, I think you should practice the way you intend to play. And uh, if you noticed on that last ball, I just kind of got down on it pretty quick. I didn't even give it that second or two of looking at it from an upright position, which is what I usually do as part of my pre-shot routine. And, uh, you know, it was an easy shot, it, whatever, but it's so, at least for me at my level, my stroke, I, I mean, I play five to ten hours a week, if that. And... Um, you know, when you're a pro and you've got those tens of thousands of hours behind you and you're and you're in gear and you're and you're in stroke all the time, it's one thing. But at my level, it's it's actually easy to just take something for granted and turn your wrist a little on the way through or pop up a little bit on the way through. And you can miss the simplest shots that way. And uh, just taking that second or two before you get down on the ball to to get sort of set and ready makes a big difference uh, consistency wise overall. So it's a good habit to get into. Again, you don't have to sit there and stare at the ball for 10 seconds, but just having that sort of pre-trigger before you shoot um, yeah, it really helps. See, like I'm doing right now, it's an easy shot, six balls right over the pocket, but I took that second or two just to line it up, make sure my body's going to fall down in the consistent position that I expect it to be in, as opposed to just um, being lazy and just slumping down over the shot right away. You very rarely see the top pros doing that unless they're in just total dead stroke. And you did see before I shot that shot, I looked at where I wanted to be, give myself some sort of reference angle on the eight, uh, make sure I don't come too far or not far enough, which would then turn the shot into a more difficult shot, which would then make getting position on the 10 a little less of a high percentage. Those little glances can make a big difference on extending your runs. So again, I, I, I like this. This is a really good way to practice. Uh, especially for begin, uh, maybe beginning players, it might be a little tough because again, you're going to need a little bit of guidance, I think, on on what you should be working on as far as patterns and stuff. Um, it's kind of hard to do self discovery on that. I mean, you certainly can if you hit enough balls and if you watch enough, uh, you know, some of the great videos and stuff that are out there now. But um, uh, but for certainly for the intermediate or like lower advanced kind of player, this is a great drill. And you can see I made a little what I call like a micro mistake there. I really should have made sure I wasn't compromised and jacked up over that ball. But it wasn't so bad that I didn't think I could execute the shot with a reasonable uh, amount of precision. 
had I been completely jacked up over it and like frozen to the front of the ball, I, I probably would not have counted that shot and would have just uh, stopped and, you know, reshot it again. Or just if I knew what I did, just, uh, you know, kind of marked one up for the ghost, so to speak, and just keep going. You saw me pause a little bit there. Um, I had multiple ways to get on the ball, so I was just trying to figure out, from, for me, what the, the highest percentage route was going to be. And you can see there, I, I was contemplating, do I shoot the ball on the side and go two rails around for the eight, or do I just take a slightly longer shot but make sure I stay in line for the eight? So I decided to do that. And you can see it allowed me to hit the ball softly and, and stay in line and, and not have to risk, oops, Forgot about that. <laughs> so there's a little lapse in concentration. I actually left myself pretty good on the nine. I mean, I did have a little bit of an angle, but nothing that I couldn't handle. Um, tried to play it simple. I still think that was the right way to do it. I just kind of maybe under hit the eight to the nine a little bit, a little worried about something, who knows. But I definitely should have made the nine, probably just a little lapse in concentration. And again, that happens at my level, especially, and, and people that play a little worse than me. Um, for sure. <laughs> One other side note, I mean, you can do it however you want, but you can saw there I ended up, I uh, had seven balls on the table because sometimes I'll throw out an extra one or whatever. I try to be consistent so that I don't give myself preferential treatment, and I try to always remove the lowest numbered ball on the table if I do end up with an extra ball. That way I'm not, <clears throat> you know, looking at the table and saying, okay, well, this time I'm going to take the four ball off, or this time I'm going to take the nine ball off. Um, I always just take the lowest numbered ball off, leaving me the, the highest numbered balls to run. I want it to be as random as possible. I don't want to, you know, anybody can throw out balls in a pattern and, and run them. You want it to be a, you can see I got that six ball in kind of a bad spot on the rail even. I mean, that's reality. That's going to happen sometimes. So I just want it to be a random collection of, of patterns. Even here on these shots, for me personally, you know, you always have that decision. Do I try to kill the ball, stay on the left side of the seven, or do I hit it and go over to the right side? And, and there's always that decision you have to make, and you have to make that for yourself and, and really be cognizant of it and control. You know, I came down a little low on that, but again, reasonable. But I used a little too much, you know, a little too high on the, on the position, on the tip position on the cue ball. So those little tiny things can make a big difference as for um, your consistency and your percentages when you're running out. And you can see on that shot from the 8 to the 9, I allowed myself to let the stroke out a little, which is a cleaner, more precise way, more accurate way of making that shot. And I just allowed myself to come past the line of the 9 ball and come all the way across so that I could shoot it in the side. Um, had I tried to hit it softer and hold up for the corner, I uh, the percentage of making the the ball is less. So it's better to, um, anytime you have one of those back cuts like that into the corner pocket, rather than using a bunch of English or whatever, only use English if you need it to avoid a scratch, either in the side or the corner. Um, otherwise, try to hit it with a nice, smooth speed. Uh, and if you watch the pros, the way they hit that shot, if at all possible, they're hitting that ball with a pretty firm stroke and usually a tad of outside English to make sure they miss the scratch in the side pocket. Um, they they want to land right between the side and the corner. I'm going to do, I think my next video I'm going to do uh, for my channel is going to be talking about the key area uh, between the first and third diamonds on the end rails, kind of that semicircle, almost like a, looks like the key 
kind of at the top of the free throw line in, in basketball. And I want to really talk about the importance of that area, uh, both for playing position and for playing safe. So I'll look for that uh, coming soon. And again, I was playing okay today, uh, you know, not like my best, like total dead stroke mode or whatever, but the way I would expect to play and uh, making minimal amount of mistakes and I've lost a little track of the game count. Again, I'm going to come back after I do this voiceover and, and add the video overlays. Maybe I should have done that first. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll do that next time. But uh, so, but I, but I feel like I'm, uh, I'm watching myself here and I'm not disappointed with what I'm seeing. I'm rolling the ball nice and... In general, keeping my speed to that three, four, five speed I like to use, um, and uh, just keeping everything simple, which will win you a lot of games. So I really like this drill. I, I do it here and there. It is different than playing the ghost. I hold myself to a higher level of accountability when I'm doing this drill. When I'm playing the ghost, I'm just trying to get that victory. If I have to bank a ball, you know. If I have a cluster and I just have to willy-nilly kind of like smash into the balls and try to make something happen, uh, almost like you're playing a ring game where it's just total offense. I mean, that's a different way of playing. But uh, this drill, to me, if you do this drill with three, four, five, six, whatever level you're at, it gives you a great percentage of knowing what you think you should be able to execute. And then if you're not doing it in a game, let's say you do this drill with four balls and you're at, let's say, 50%. That means if you got ball in hand on the six and you're playing nine ball, half the time you should get out, half the time you shouldn't in a game situation. If you feel like you're more like on 10 or 20%, then then you need to figure out kind of your mental part of your game. Something's not working right in, in a game that you're able to execute in practice. And that has to do with a big part of that is confidence. And uh, you know, there's a number of really good books out there. I myself have been going through a little bit of a confidence issue lately. Uh, new aiming system I've been working on, some new other things, and uh, it doesn't translate as well into matches yet, I've found. Uh, I'm not running out as much as I used to, but when I'm practicing, I can see that I'm doing everything pretty decently. A few small smoke stroke things that I'd like to work on, but overall, I'm hitting the ball okay, and uh, I get into a match and it's not showing, and it's purely a function of confidence and anxiety and... Um, just the, being in those kind of conditions. So I got pretty flat on this three ball. I normally would just almost not count it right there, but I hit a great recovery shot, little jacked up kind of almost jump mass A type shot. And uh, I figured, okay, if I recover, I might still count it. And here comes one of my buddies, Mark. And uh, you're going to see in about four seconds here what, what happens when your focus gets interrupted. <laughs> It's really hard sometimes to refocus uh, when external things hit you. And again, that, that goes back to, yep, there we go. I remembered that. And I was mad because, you know, and again, part of me and you guys out there, I could blame Mark. Why did he come over? Man, I was shooting good, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? If I needed to take an extra five seconds there to reset my brain and re-get my focus back, then that's what I needed to do. It's not Mark's fault or anybody else's fault. It's my fault. Uh, when that server walks by your table and it distracts your eye a little bit or some commotion happens at the table next to you, it's not their fault. Uh, it's your fault if you miss. You have every opportunity to get back up off the ball, go take a sip of water, Coke, or whatever you're drinking, and, and, and reset and get your mind back in that state. You know, you get in a little groove, and I get that, but you got to find your way to, to get back in that groove and don't let these external influences um, affect you. Easier said than done, I know, but um, I'm actually usually pretty good at that. And again, I probably was not going to count that anyways, um, or should not have counted that anyways when I got flat on the three, although that really wasn't necessarily a mistake. Uh, it was just kind of an unfortunate uh, result of traveling all the way down the table to get shape on that ball. The key is now is to refocus that next rack. Even if you do make a mistake, you know, if I mess up here, and I did. Um, you can see, I was just talking about it. It's funny, I couldn't remember this. I did this about a week or two ago. Um, that lack of focus, it carries over. And I'm also looking down at my little thing that I'm keeping. I'm actually using a calculator app on my phone to keep track of the score. Uh, I didn't have a piece of paper. I could have gotten one, of course. But 
it's kind of it's kind of nice if you don't have beads above the table. You just use a calculator app and just I, I just put in the score as one zero, you know, ten, twenty, thirty, and then when I lose one, thirty one, thirty two, whatever, and you just keep score that way. It's kind of easy. It's hard if you don't keep score every single rack, you will forget. You'll be like, did I win that last game or not? So, anyways, you can see I'm expressing uh, a little frustration here, and uh, it's self frustration again. Nothing to do with anything else, but. I got mad because I was doing actually really well on this drill for me. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to screw it up. Uh, like I said, I usually get uh, 13, 14. My average probably 14, but uh, 13, 14, 15. And I had an opportunity there. I think I only messed up twice so far, and I'm getting close to the end. And I thought maybe I could finish 18, 2. And, you know, I think my best I've ever done on this is 17 with six balls. So, you know, when you get close to those personal bests, you know, it's uh, whether it's a uh, striking out in bowling or uh you know getting your best score in golf i mean it's funny how that internal self-pressure tends to creep in and i love that personally because it mimics the pressure we feel when we're in matches um you always want to try to practice in a way that replicates the pressure you're going to feel in a match and i got a little close to that 10 ball there and i you can see i can still cue completely fully if i got jacked up over at that 10 ball i would not have counted it I mean, you have to be that strict with things. I was also going to mention, uh, I was talking about before, when I played recently in the U.S. Amateur Qualifiers, I played, uh, I did not have an easy draw at all. I played, uh, I had five matches to win. I stayed on the winner's side the whole time. And I had five, like, quality opponents. As a matter of fact, uh three of the four people I beat to get to the finals also made it to the finals on the way that they, the way they do the U S amateur is there's different boards. So there's like 10 qualifiers from my, um, from my room. And so there's 10 different boards of, of 12 to 16 players. And if you win your board, you go to the national finals. And if you lose a match, the way they run the tournament, you, you get routed to a different board. So if you lose a match to somebody, you never have to play that person again. Uh, kind of like how in a tournament chart, typically if you lose, you go to the opposite side of the chart. You don't have to meet up with that person until unless you make it all the way back to the, you know, the finals again, and they do as well. Okay, so you saw right there. I'm watching this again. I did this about two weeks ago. Usually I have it kind of fresh in my mind, and uh, and I remember kind of what happened. But you can see I just got a little off angle on that one ball. Uh, I planned the route. Maybe I mishit it a little bit, whatever. But I bumped the eight. You can see that I had a shot on the two. I could have easily recovered, made the two ball, and got back on the three, but because I ran into a ball that I did not intend to run into, no count. So again, very, you have to be very strict with this if you're going to do it the right way. Now, normally, I would have set the one ball up, and I would have shot it again, and if I would have messed it again, I would have maybe shot it five more times to try to really reinforce that proper route to take to that ball or the right decision-making. So um, again, because I was doing the video, I did not do that, but that's normally what I would so getting back to the U.S. Amateur, I um, I just didn't play that well, and I don't. I, I I've been playing around with the new uh, aiming system for the last couple months. I'm pretty excited about that. I'm actually pocketing balls probably ten or twenty percent better than I was with the way I was doing it before, and um, I've had to kind of reincorporate a little bit, just subtly alter my pre-shot routine and. I've sort of also at the time, same time sort of refined the way I was applying spin to the ball. Um, not because the aiming system required it. I just kind of found a little better way to do that again for myself. It's all about for me for percentages. If I find something where I'm a little more accurate with something or a little more uh, consistent, then that's what I'm going to go with. And I'm not going to shuffle. I don't switch every two weeks or anything. I've been aiming. I've used a few different aiming systems. I'm familiar with almost all of them. I teach almost all of them. But I just kind of stumbled upon something that uh, that I like, and that's what I've been using. And uh, I don't know. I, I think I, I just I'm very hard on myself, and I think I go through lack of confidence sometimes. And uh, especially when there's a change, recent change, it's not something you've been doing for 20 years. It's something you've been doing for two months. Uh, it can break down under pressure a little bit, and that that doubt can creep in, at least for me. So I'm trying to figure out how to work through that a little bit, but. Um, the entire U.S. Amateur, four four races to seven and one race to 11 in the finals, a combination of eight and nine ball. I, I don't remember running a single rack of nine ball from the break, not one. Um, very unusual for me. 
and an eight ball. I do remember running one or two eight ball racks and maybe one rack off of somebody else's dry break, but it really became just a, a, a war of attrition sort of, uh, maybe the other player just made a few more mistakes than me. Um, or, or I took advantage of the right shots at the right time. I don't know, but, uh, I played all quality opponents too. There was 110 people there. There easily could have been 60 to 70 people, maybe even 80 people out of those 110 that I'm never, ever, ever supposed to lose to. And then there were probably some players that could beat you if you're playing bad. And then there were probably a good solid 10 to 15 players like myself, or maybe even better that, uh, you know, that I had to get to. And, um, of the four opponents I had before I got to the finals, three of them lost to me, went on to another board, and came all the way through the loser's bracket and got to the finals of their board to play for a spot in the national finals as well. And um, uh, and trying to think, two of them made it out of the three. So I basically, I never had one of those kind of um, easy matches to get started with or an easy match to kind of just get in stroke with. So I do feel good about that looking back on it. I didn't feel that way at the time. I didn't really realize it until I was driving home with my buddy and we were talking about things that, that brought that to my attention. But um, And I was actually down 5 nothing in the finals and the guy missed a nine ball. And uh, it just seemed to have rattled him and took him out of his groove. He was out playing me, out saving me, out shooting me, everything. And uh, that just gave me a little bit of confidence. And I, I came back and won 11-7, which uh, not really don't really think of myself as a comeback player but I did in that instance and I was uh, I was happy with that for sure so hopefully you guys enjoyed the commentary again normally I'd sit here I could sit here and talk about all the different position routes or whatever spin and uh, you know in general if you watched I, I think I kept things pretty simple on most of my routes there wasn't anything even extreme I had to do that's the whole point when I do a ghost video, I'll, I'll focus more on the position. But for this, the whole point is to not do anything excessive. It's to just, you know, look as smooth as possible. Just keep that ball on the string, so to speak, and play the right speed, right parts of the ball. You know, I would say 80 to 90% of the shots I shot, there was nothing special about them because I was playing good position. And, and that's the whole focus. So getting to the end here with these last two shots. I hope you guys really enjoyed the video. Please feel free to leave me any comments on my website, which is mypoolschool.com, or on my YouTube channel. You can just search for my name, Scott Rolleder, R-O-H-L-E-D-E-R. And uh, again, hope you enjoyed it, and look for more content in the future. Thanks, and I appreciate it.